So Jennifer's also a Sussex PhD. There's a lot of us hanging around. <laughs> but she's now um, an award-winning, I believe, teaching fellow. Is that a recent one? Yeah. Student Award? Yeah. yeah. Um, she's uh, working with Julia Simner and Jamie Ward working on uh, synesthesia. Um, Jennifer's actually a synesthete herself, which I think she's going to tell us more about. And apparently one of her favourite things to do is argue with other synesthetes about what colour things should be. <laughs> so I hand over to Jennifer now, who's going to talk to us about the colourful words of graphene colour synesthesia. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, as you've just heard, I am a synesthete myself, and that's really how I became interested in synesthesia to begin with. Um, I very clearly recall being in a German class in my undergraduate and mentioning to somebody that their name was Orange. I don't remember their name anymore, but I know that it was Orange of some description. And uh, having this experience that a lot of synesthetes have, um, which is telling somebody something that seems very obvious to you, like, oh, you have a nice orange name, and getting a totally blank, just confusion in response. Um, so, I'd like to introduce some of you to synesthesia, if you're not familiar with what it is, um, and maybe even introduce a couple of you to the idea that you might be a synesthete yourself, because uh, sometimes it takes somebody explaining it to realize that it's something that you also uh, perceive. So, what is synesthesia is our first question, um, and this turns out to be a not a very easy question to answer um, because it takes a lot of different forms. So, the basic idea is that it's kind of a uh, conscious, multimodal experience that automatically happens. So, some examples, for instance, is that uh, people have colors and spatial arrangements for uh, months of the year, for instance, or for days of the week. Um, some people, for instance, might see spoken words kind of written out in their visual field. Um, the particular type that I'm interested in is called grapheme color synesthesia. So a grapheme is just any kind of written uh, linguistic symbol. So, uh, for instance, you might have an alphabet like this for the non-synesthetes, it might look black. For the synesthetes, they would have an experience that looks a bit more like this. So a lot of different colors. Um, and I've actually come back to, as I've done presentations over the years, come back to uh, my alphabet, uh, and over the years this alphabet hasn't really changed. It has changed a little bit, uh, but it hasn't changed that much. And that's actually the way that we identify synesthesia, is by people reporting very, very highly specific, but very consistent associations across months or years. Even. Um, so, what I'm particularly interested in are people's color impressions for letters, but I'm also really interested in words. So my original degree was in linguistics, and I'm really interested in how people process and understand words and colors and meaning. Uh, so, as you can see, I've written in the bottom, synesthesia with all of the different letters kind of uh, in their proper colors, or not their proper colors, if you are also a graduate color synesthete, so I'm sorry if I'm making anyone angry. Um, but synesthetes also suggest that uh, the first letter often contributes its color to the whole word. So the word synesthesia might be primarily blue because of that blue first letter, for instance. So using that information, we can ask some interesting colors about different types of words. And one of the kinds of words I'm really interested in is words that actually already have color intrinsically in them, even for non-synesthetes. So an example of this is words that are that have a color association based on their meaning. So for instance, the clearest example are color terms, like the word red. Um, so when you hear or uh, read or speak the word red, you have this impression of a kind of prototypical color that's associated with red, and we would expect that the word red would also be colored red. Um, but similarly, there are also words that might have a color association with them because of your experience in dealing with these sorts of things in the real world. So for instance, fire might have a fiery orange color. So something that I'm interested then in is the uh, kind of the intersection with synesthesia. So if you're a synesthete with a purple R, though, the word red would actually appear purple to you instead. Or, for instance, if you have a cool blue F, the word fire should actually be a cool color instead of a warm color. And that conflict is called the alien color effect. So this feeling there's this mismatch between the, col the color that a word should be and the color that it is synesthetically. So what I was interested in is, how do synesthetes kind of resolve this conflict between these two different color impressions? Um, so one of the things we did was ask a bunch of synesthetes what colors they experience for different types of words. Color terms like red, or highly kind of imageable uh, words like fire. 
And uh, so one of the things that we found, for instance, is that it depends on how frequent this word is in the language. So red, for instance, is one of the most frequent color terms in English. It comes up a lot. Um, and what we found was that when we asked synesthetes to kind of describe uh, what color they experienced for this word, they kind of had this choice between prototypical red or the color based on the letter. We found that that was likely to actually be prototypically red. However, we have uh, we ask, also asked them about low frequency color terms, words like azure, which is a nice sky blue color. And when we asked them to explain whether that should be uh, what color that should be, then they were more likely to go for the letter based color instead. So this tells us a couple of really interesting things. So one of the first things that tells us is that synesthesia isn't just purely an uncontrollable automatic perceptual experience. So if that were the case, we would expect that all of these words would be colored like their letters no matter what their meaning was. But what we actually found was that it depended on your real world experience. It depended on what you kind of knew and what you had associated over your lifetime. So that means there's an influence of actual meaning and of life experience on the color that you experience as a synesthete. Um, so that tells us about how synesthesia interacts with kind of personal experience. Uh, but it also tells us something interesting about how words might be represented in the brain for everyone. So this seems to suggest that even for non-synesthetes, when you are thinking of a word that has a color association with it, that color association is automatically brought to the mind. And over time, as you practice or as you see those words many, many times over your life, that color association might become stronger or, or clearer. So synesthesia actually allows us to investigate how even non-synesthetes might also learn and process language by contrast with the colors that they themselves experience. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Anecdotally, that uh, I've heard of a blind synesthete who did have color synesthesia anyway, but I don't want to go into too much detail on that because I don't have a good cited source to back it up. Yes? Do you know whether it's ethical to have that conflict? Does it deplete self control like that? I don't know the answer to that. Um, one of the things that this actually looked at was um, how kind of the prototypical color of the word, so the red of red, actually pulls on the, the letter-based color. And so the analysis that we did tried to find out how much, how strong of a pull that had. And at the end of the study, we asked the synesthetes, where actually does the, do these colors come from? Um, and a lot of them reported, sort of subjectively, that they found it really difficult to do, that they found it really frustrating, and you know, they, it was kind of a, a difficult task. So I expect there would be some sort of uh, effortfulness involved, but we haven't measured that specifically. How would, um, in, in non synesthetes how do these, do these associations help us in some way? What do they, what do, they do? Uh, So help, I guess. Um, or is it, is, it, is it a consequence of something, or just does it happen? Or does it have a function? So there's some really interesting research about kind of how these sorts of things are automatically simulated when you are speaking or using language. The uh, information on color simulation is kind of just recently becoming more popular and becoming slightly more. Um, but there's a lot of research known about kind of simulation of motor function and that sort of thing. When you hear a word like kick, then you are also simulating the, the action. So it seems to be kind of an intrinsic part of the way that people learn and use language. Um, we're just using synesthetes here to be able to measure the 